Hi. Today's session, I'd like to talk a little bit about how to estimate the cost of debt and the market value of debt, especially including leases. Both numbers are critical to getting a cost of capital, but let's stay with debt for today's session. The company I'm going to use to illustrate the process is Home Depot, and I'm doing this analysis as of March of 2013. The reason I'm emphasizing that is Home Depot is a very strange fiscal year. It goes January 31st through January 31st. You think, so what? The most recent 10K I found for Home Depot was actually from January 31st of 2012. So it's going to be a year and two months old, and there have been 10 Qs since. But I'm going to start with the 10K and talk a little bit about how to adjust the values when you don't have an updated 10K. For most of you who have December 31st, 2012, calendar years, this is not going to be an issue. Your 10Ks are already out. You can use the most recent 10K. But just in case you don't have an updated 10K, maybe this session will help you figure out what to do when you don't have a recent annual report at 10K. So let's start the process. Here are the things I'd like to know. I'd like to estimate how much debt the Home Depot has in conventional interest-bearing debt. I'd like to figure out what to do about those lease commitments, which, as, as we talked about in class, should be treated as debt. I need a cost of debt, a pre-tax cost of debt, and presumably I can convert that into an after-tax cost of debt. And all of that is going to be dealt with in today's session. So let's start basic. To do all of this for ho the Home Depot, the first place I went was to the most, most recent fiscal, the, the financial disclosure, the 10K, as I said. And even though it's an old 10K, let's start with the numbers that you can get there. So this is January 31st of 2012. Here's the balance sheet, and you can see it's, you know, it's highlighted. I went through the balance sheet, and let me isolate the items that I'm going to treat as interest-bearing debt. So there's a consolidated balance sheet. There are the assets, and the, there are the liabilities. I'm not going to count accounts payable as debt, accrued salaries, sales taxes, deferred revenue, and income taxes payable. Neither am I going to count other accrued expenses. And the reason, again, is very simple. It's not because these are not liabilities, but these are not explicit interest-bearing liabilities. Put differently, even though there might be some costs associated with using supplier credit, they're not made explicit in the income statement. So the only item from the current liabilities that I'm going to count as part of interest-bearing debt is the current installments of long-term debt. For those of you with other companies, there might be a short-term debt in there as well for most companies. But in the case of the Home Depot, all you have are current installments of long-term debt. Then if you keep going below the current liabilities, the next item says long-term debt, excluding current installments. I'm going to count that as debt as well. So that's 10758 plus 30, 10788 million. Then I come to another item. It's a fairly large item. It says other long-term liabilities. To be quite honest, I'm not quite sure what's in there. I checked through the footnotes to make sure I wasn't missing any, any more interest-bearing debt. Nothing was made explicit about these long-term liabilities, so I'm going to assume they're not interest-bearing debt. When in doubt, leave it out. That rhymes, so stay with that. Okay. So 10788 million in book value of debt. I'm actually going to open up a spreadsheet on the side so you can see me work through these numbers as I go through. So what you'll see listed under the input page for book value of interest-bearing debt is 10788 million right off the balance sheet. The next item I need is interest expense from the most recent year. So I go back to the income statement, and there are two items I'm going to pull off here. The interest expense for the most recent year, the recent, most recent year being January 29th of 2000, ending the, for the fiscal year ending January 29th, is 606 million, so I've entered that as the interest expense. I also pulled out the operating income, 6,661 million, entered that as well. Then comes an item that's, that's it'll be nice to know if I want to convert this book value of debt. That 10,788 million, after all, is the book value of debt from the balance sheet. To convert to a market value, I need an ex a maturity for the debt. So here's what I did. I went looking through the footnotes, and somewhere on page There you go. On this page, you'll see the breakdown of debt and when it comes due. And you'll see the, all of the, the debt that the Home Depot has and when the debt comes due. So here's what I did to convert that into a weighted maturity. I copied that entire section into the weighted maturity of debt spreadsheet here. So what you see here is actually right out of the 10K. That's the debt that the Home Depot has available. And I made some judgment calls. Remember, I'm in March of 2012. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the due date on this debt, debt as of 
you know, even though the debt was reported a year ago, I'm just taking the due date of the debt and approximating how much time there is between now and when the debt comes due. So as an example, the first item is off the books already. I don't even know why they listed. It's been paid off. The second item is debt due December 16th of 2013. I'm going to put a rough approx as a rough, rough approximation one year as when the debt comes due. I know you can put 0.75. I don't think it's worth finessing this too much. The amount due, I pulled right off the statement. I pulled that in there. And I do this for each of the items. So the, 2000, so the 2013 is one year. The 2016 is four years. The amount due is in the next column. I know this is not quite perfect, but it's close enough. So I have the total amount due in each period, the number of years, and I compute the percentage of the total debt due, computed by adding up these numbers. And note that doesn't always have to add up to what you see on the balance sheet because not all companies give you the details of the maturity of all of their debt outstanding. All I care about is that the, the debt they report is a total value of 10780 million, which is pretty close to what their book value of debt is, to be quite honest, for Home Depot. You see the percentage of debt due in each period. I take a weighted maturity, which basically means I take the number of years times their weight, add them all up, and the weighted maturity that I get for the Home Depot's debt is 14.82 years. That's what you see inputted as the weighted maturity of the debt. You're saying, what if I can't find it? Just enter zero years. What will happen then is your book value of debt will be treated as market value of debt. I know it's not, no, it's not perfect, but if you don't have the data, what else can you do? So I have all the inputs I need on debt. Let me go to the next input. It says, do you have any lease commitments? You say, how will I know? The only way to find out is to browse through your annual report at 10K. Now, U.S. companies, if they have lease commitments, will have to give that those lease commitments as a footnote to their 10K. And that's basically what I went looking for for the Home Depot. And I did find the lease commitments. Pull them up here. Sorry. In the financial statements in one of the footnotes. So let me see if I can find that footnote. It's a little further back, I think. Oh, no, maybe not. Maybe further forward. Okay. Okay, there you go. You see the lease commitments, and you see two columns. One says capital leases, the other says operating leases. Here's something to remember about capital leases. Capital leases already treated as debt on the balance sheet. You don't have to worry about them. So in other words, accountants have done for capital leases what we're going to do to our operating leases. So all I care about are operating leases. And, then, and so here I'm going to say yes because I have lease commitments. And it asks you for a bunch of input about, inputs about lease commitments. The first item it asks you is what was the operating lease expense in the most recent year? Most U.S. companies, as part of the lease commitment table, if you look just above the table, which is what I'm doing, tell you what the lease payment was for the most recent year. Notice that the Home Depot calls the lease expense rent expense. Companies go back and forth between calling lease expense rent or lease, so they're interchangeable. So in this case, the lease expense for 2011, fiscal 2011, which is the year ending January 29th of 2012, is 823 million. So I enter that. Then I go to the commitment table because the rest of the numbers come off the table. And that's and what you see here is right off the commitment table. So I enter the lease commitment in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. Beyond year five, U.S. companies don't have to break down the lease commitments by year. They just have to give you a lump sum. So what I put in is that lump sum of $4,577 million. I'm almost done. Then I ask you, can you ask input the pre-tax cost of debt on your own? Now you're saying, when will I be able to do that? A couple of scenarios. One is if you have uh, if you have a company that has issued bonds and you can look up the yield to maturity in the bond, you trust it as your pre-tax cost of debt for the entire company. The other is, and this is the more likely scenario, is your company already has a rating from S&P or Moody's and you're willing to trust the ratings agency. Keyword is willing. In the case of the Home Depot, I did find a rating for the Home Depot. Here's how I found it. I went into Google search. I typed in Home Depot and an and S&P rating, and it did show up. And the rating that was reported for the Home Depot is, and this is I found this right off on Google uh, on a, from a Google search and from a more from a fairly recent news report. It's an S&P report on the Home Depot. If you go down, it gives you the rating. The Standard and Poor's rating services gives an A minus credit rating. 
Now you're saying, what am I going to do with that rating? If you go to the synthetic rating worksheet in the same in the same spreadsheet, I actually give you the typical default spread for an A minus rated company is 1.3 percent. The risk-free rate, the 10-year bond rate when I was doing this in March of 2013 was 1.93%. You add the 1.3% to it, you get a pre-tax cost of debt of 3.23%. So in the case of the Home Depot, I've said yes to entering the pre-tax cost of debt and entered the number. You're saying, what if I don't have a rating? Don't worry, because you can enter no there, and I will actually estimate a rating for you based on your interest coverage ratio. But if you enter no there, I'll ask you for, for a follow-up input, which is what kind of firm is it? Is it a small company or a large company? Because the rules for large companies tend to be a little looser. They get better ratings for the same interest coverage ratio. So one is a, small, is a large company, which is a market cap greater than $5 billion. Two is a small company, market cap less than $5 billion. Pick your Pick your number. The, ra the, the rating and the, and the um, cost of debt will be computed accordingly. Then I ask you for a risk-free rate, and here's a tricky input. If you have a U.S. company or any uh, of a company in a AAA-rated country, this number should be zero. But if you have a company in a country that's AA, single A, triple B, double B rated, remember what we talked about in class, that that company carries two burdens on its shoulder. One is its own default risk, and the other is the country's default risk. If your company is in a country which is not AAA rated, enter the default spread for the country. That's also available on my website and should be available to you by now if you've done the cost of equity. Enter that number as the country default spread. That's pretty much it. So let me take you through the process of what I'm going to do next. I'm going to first convert the lease commitments into debt. So here are my lease commitments, and these all came from your input page, so you don't have to mess with any of the other worksheets. They all come from the numbers you entered on the input page. I take your inputs, which are the commitments for the next five years and beyond. I take your pre-tax cost today. Before I get too carried away, here's what I do. I try to convert that lump sum in year six into an annual amount. Why? Because I don't think that the Home Depot will have $4,577 million in lease expenses in year six. So here's how I convert it into a, into a number of years. I know what the average lease commitment was over the first five years. So I take that average. I divide the 4,577 by that average. I convert it into an integer that comes up to seven years. Approximately speaking, I'm converting the 4,577 million into seven years of payments of about 653 million and change. I have pretty much everything I need to convert the lease commitments to debt. I take the present value of each lease commitment back to the present using the 3.23% as my discount rate, the pre-tax cost of debt. Why pre-tax cost of debt? Because these are pre-tax commitments. What I get as a present value, 6,005 to 76 million, is the estimated market value of my lease debt. Now here's the other piece. I have a book value of debt I'd like to convert to market value. So here's what I do. I take the book value of debt, I take the interest expense, I take the weighted maturity. Then I treat it as if it were a corporate bond with a book value, with a face value of 10,788 and a coupon payment of 606 million with a maturity of 14.82 years. I discount all those cash flows back. So the 606 million every year for 14.82 years and the 10,788 at the end of 14.82 years discounted back at 3.23% gives me an estimated market value of 13,784 million. Why is it so much higher than the book value? There's actually a simple reason. If you take the interest expense and divide by the book value, you come up with a book interest rate of 5.62%. The market interest rate for the Home Depot is 3.23%. Given that the book interest rate, which is like a coupon rate, is so much higher than the market rate, this is like a bond that trades at a premium over face value because the market interest rate is much lower than the coupon rate. So we've essentially converted the book value debt into market value. You add the lease commitments, which are already in market value terms because we use today's cost of debt. The total value that you get for the debt is 20360 million. That is going to become my market value of debt. Now you're saying, what would have happened if I did not have a rating? Let's see what happens. If I'd entered no here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to compute your rating. And to compute your rating, I first take whatever you've inputted. You said, you're a large firm. I'm going to use the, the table for large firms, which is this table. I use the fact that you have leases. And here's what I do when you say you have leases. I reflect the fact that your lease commitments are going to make you more, more risky. So your stated operating income and interest expense will get adjusted by me for whatever your lease commitments are on top of it. Put differently, my interest coverage ratio that you see here is not just going to be your stated operating income divided by the stated 
interest expense, it's going to be adjusted for the fact that you have lease commitments. And you're saying adjusted by how much? I actually compute how much you'd have had as interest expense if this had been, you know, if, if this had been treated as, you know, if the lease commitments had been treated as debt. So the interest coverage ratio I come up with is not just with your conventional debt, it reflects the fact that you have lease commitments outstanding, which is the way it should be. I use that interest coverage ratio with a lookup table to get a synthetic rating, AAA. The default spread based on the synthetic rating is 0.4%, which would have given me a pre-tax cost of debt for the Home Depot if I'd had, you know, if I'd used the synthetic rating of 2.33%. That's what I'd have then used to con compute the operating lease debt, which would be much higher now. The present value would be much higher because the discount rate is much lower. The market value of debt will also change because I'll be using a much lower interest rate. So if you don't have a rating, don't worry because you can compute a synthetic rating, use it to get a cost of debt, and that'll work out. So let me change this back to yes because it's you know, I already have a rating and a cost of debt. Might as well use it. So that's pretty much it. So let me go, let me review the process. First, start with your annual report at 10K. Get the book value of debt, interest bearing, just interest bearing debt. Don't try to be conservative and include everything in debt. Uh, get the interest expense. Get the weighted maturity if you can, and get the operating income, especially if you're going to use an interest coverage ratio. If you have lease commitments, get those lease commitments out of the footnotes. You enter that in. Come up with the cost of debt, either on your own or using a synthetic rating. And if you have, a, if you are a company in an, in an emerging market, add on that country default spread for that country because that'll push up your cost of debt. That pretty much caps uh, captures what you're going to be doing in this process. So, and one more thing, as you can see, this 10K is dated. It's a year and two months old. In about a month, the problem is going to go away. You're going to have a 2013 10K. You're saying, what do I do now? I do have a 10Q. Let me pull up that number for the 10Q. And in the 10Q, they give me the updated numbers. So here's what I'm going to do to update the Home Depot's debt. So this is from the most recent 10Q, which is November 3rd, no, 31st to 30th of 2012. The debt has increased very slightly. So let me go in and change the debt to from 10,788 to 10,813, which is the sum of those you know, which is this 10779 plus 39 million. For the interest expense, here's what you need to do. And this is a little messy, so let me go through. Here's the interest expense for, so if you know, if every 10Q, they will give you the three months and the nine months ending. So let me go to the nine months ending October 28th of 2012 and the nine months ending October 30th of 2011. Here's what the interest expense looks like, 466, versus 452. In other words, the first nine months of the most recent fiscal year have interest expenses $14 million higher than the first nine months of the previous year. So which basically means if I want to update this number, I'm going to take the 606 and I'm going to add on the 14 million. So I've got the updated interest expense for the most recent year. And here's where I start to run into problems. 10 Qs are not as detailed as 10 Ks. So you can't update You'll have a tough time updating the weighted maturity and the lease commitments. I know this is not perfect, but I can I can update the operating income, so I'm going to do that. And the operating income earnings before, you know, if you look at the operating income, the operating income actually increased by roughly seven hundred and I'm sorry, six hundred and eighty-five million. The difference between six thousand and sixteen and five thousand three thirty-one. So let me go in and make those changes. So basically, I'm going to add 6,016 minus 5,331. So I updated what I could. The operating income got updated. The interest expense got updated. The book value of debt got updated. The weighted maturity of debt did not. The lease commitments did not. Would I like to update them? Sure. But since I don't have the data, there's not much I can do. So I'm going to leave those numbers at the most recent 10K numbers. I know it sounds inconsistent, but I'm actually being consistent. I'm using the most updated data I can for every single input. So I know it's, you know, it, you might not be comfortable doing this, but, and for most of you, it's not going to be an issue. As I said, if you have a December 31st, 2012 year end, but if you don't, you will have to update what you can and leave untouched what you cannot. So if you update those numbers, your market value of debt, and if you go look at the output, is slightly different because my lease commitments stay what they are, but my market interest, my market value of interest-bearing debt does change very slightly. 
So that's how you can update the numbers if you don't have a recent 10K. I hope you found this, this, um, this webcast useful. And if you get a chance, try it out in a real company, especially your own. That's about it.